Amen. All right. Well, um, we are uh, in the series, if you've been here uh, for a few weeks, we've been uh, looking at the life of Joseph. Um, and if, it, if it's your first time, don't worry, I'll catch you up um, along the way. So, but I have a question first. Um, does anybody remember the, uh, anybody around, I was a little bit before my time, but remember the, um, the, the 1980s men's U.S. Olympic hockey team. The, they call it the Miracle on Ice. Do you remember that? Anybody around for that? Um, uh, yeah, this is a picture right here where, you know, they, uh, what happened was they were a bunch of, a team of amateurs. They were college players. You know, these guys weren't professionals at all, and they were going into this round-robin game against the Soviet Union that was like, and the Soviets were like the cream of the crop. They were the best team. It was full of um, professional hockey players, and they were by far the best team of, in the entire world. And so USA, we show up, and we go to this game, and nobody thinks that the U.S. team has a shot of winning this game. Like, nobody um, thinks that it's possible. Nobody thinks that it can be done. And it comes down to right at the last um, final seconds of the game that they um, actually pulled it through and they defeated the Soviet Union. There's a famous line, they made a movie about it several years ago called Miracle uh, because the announcer, as they were calling the game, he, uh, he said, do you believe in miracles? Right as the, the buzzer ticked away and the U.S. comes away, they went on to, to, uh, to beat Finland and I believe won the gold medal, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, yeah, it's pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. I was thinking about that because everybody loves an underdog story, right? Like you can't, I don't know about you guys, but I I remember that movie, Rudy. Remember Rudy? Anybody see that? I can't watch that thing without crying. Like at the very end, they're like, Rudy, Rudy, you know? And it's just like, it's like, oh, okay. So, but everybody loves, we love the underdog, don't we? We, we love seeing somebody kind of rise from the ashes, you know, the, the rags to riches kind of story, you know, of somebody that came, overcame the odds and had the, everything stacked against them and they were able to, to get through it and came out on the other side better than they've ever been before. Joseph, in many ways, is that story. He's an underdog. It's the underdog story of this guy that had so much stacked against him, that had been betrayed by his own family, had been lied to and and lied about and and, and mistreated by his brothers, that his entire family line had been kind of known for this manipulating one another and deceiving each other, that it didn't just start with him and his brothers, but in fact his dad was was, was a deceitful kind of person as well. And it's kind of in in his blood that that he would experience these things and he was sold into slavery and he became an employee in Potiphar's house, the captain of Pharaoh's guards, and he fortunately kind of worked his way to the top until he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and thrown into prison where he remained for years. And he started serving these, this guy, these two men, the cupbearer and the baker that we looked at last week, and it was in prison that G- Joseph's gifts really began to develop of his, his discernment and being able to interpret dreams. And finally, his gifts made a way from it, for him. His, his gift is what, found his, is what made him find his way out of prison and into the palace. And Pharaoh, just like we looked at last week, would make Joseph second in command over all of Egypt, from a slave to a leader. And authority and power, something that no one saw coming, not even Joseph. Nobody could have predicted, but God made a way. It's, you don't get more underdog than that. And, and, and it's an amazing um, thing. We're going to pick up there this week. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis chapter 41. And uh, we, we find Joseph now where he's kind of settled into his new role. Um, again, he's out of prison He's, he's, he's serving Pharaoh as the second in command over all of Egypt because, remember, there's going to be seven years of, of abundance for Egypt, seven years of plentiful harvest, seven years of, of more than enough food and prosperity, and the economy is just going to be crushing it, and Egypt is going to do really, really amazing for seven years. And then on the next seven years, they're going to endure this, this, this famine and this scarcity. And, and, and Joseph predicts that this is exactly what's going to happen. And so now Joseph is in this leadership position to help see Egypt through the next 14 years of 
uh, what's going to happen. And so he sets up all of these um, systems where people would pay, would, would give certain rations and certain crops and things to Egypt so that Joseph could begin storing it up where they could make it through the, um, through the uh, years of, of lack. And so let's read in Genesis 41, um, I think it's in verse 39, but I might be a little bit past you. So let's go for it. It says, Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zaphonath Paneah and gave him a wife, Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, priest at On. And Joseph went throughout the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Joseph left Pharaoh's presence and traveled through the land of Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced outstanding harvests. Joseph gathered all the excess food in the land of Egypt during the seven years and put it in the cities. He put the food in every city from the fields around it. So Joseph stored up grain in such abundance that it was like sand of the sea. That he stopped measuring it because it was beyond measure. Two sons were born to Joseph before the years of famine arrived. Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore them to him. So Joseph has, has so settled into his role that he starts making a family, that, that God blesses him with a wife, and they start having kids. This is where I want to camp out today. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh and said, God has made me forget all my hardship and my whole family. God has made me forget. That word Manasseh literally means to forget. Um, made me forget my, all my hardship and my whole family. And the second son, he named Ephraim and said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Then the seven years of abundance in the land of Egypt came to an end. And the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph had said. There was famine in every land, but the whole land of Egypt, there was food. When the whole land of Egypt was stricken with famine, the people cried out to Pharaoh for food. Pharaoh told all Egypt, go to Joseph and do whatever he tells you. Now the famine had spread across the whole region, so Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Every land came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain, for the famine was very severe in every land. So Joseph is positioned in a specific time, in a specific place, because, uh, again, as we've been kind of seeing this theme weave throughout week in and week out, Joseph's dream isn't for Joseph. Joseph's dream and the position that God's placed him in is that so he can actually help and serve the people, so that God needs Joseph because he needs somebody that's going to help and bless his people. But there's something very interesting that Joseph does throughout all of this that I think really tells us a lot about his mindset and his attitude and the way that he carried himself. And I believe the way he was able to endure all that he endured and not get to the position that God placed him in of being in such power and such authority and, and not be a tyrant. Because what happens a lot of times is, is, is what people do is we, we, we endure all of this kind of hardship. We, we bring through like hurt and, and, and an opportunity for offense and opportunity for all the ways that we've been mistreated. And the, the danger of what happens a lot of times is you put somebody that's been hurt and mistreated and abused and you name it and you give them a little bit of power. You know what happens? The old fr dictator the, only, the, old, the old phrase, hurt people, hurt people, is extremely true. So, so you've got to imagine that, this, that, that, that Joseph and everything that he went through, how did it not affect him? How did he stay so pure? How did he continue to love people? How did he continue to want the best for people even though they had mistreated him? Even though they had been out to get him? How did he not have all of these trust issues? How did he continue to, to live and to give and to serve and to be this generous kind of person that he was? Because I know people and you know people that don't act that way. That they, they hurt people because they're hurting because of everything that they've been through. And I think what Joseph named his sons is what we find of how he did it and his mindset around it. Because in what we just read, he says that they had two sons. 
The first one he named Manasseh. Because God has caused him to forget all of his hardship and his whole family. Now, of course, we read that and we're like, did God give Joseph amnesia? No. No. <laughs> Certainly, he remembered what happened to him. We're going to find that out next week. If, if he remembered the things that he, he had gone through in dealing with his family and, and all the hardship that he had taken place. But what God did was allow for Joseph to, 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 to not carry those hurts and carry those burdens because he was able to see God's goodness and his plan and his purpose through all of it. And so when he looked back over it, he didn't look over it with bitterness and resentment and hatred. He looked over it and he was able to see God's goodness through all of it. That's Manasseh. That, that, that when you get to that point that you say, man, it, life has not always been easy. But God has been so good to me that when I look back, I don't see and I don't experience the hurt anymore. I look back and I, and I see and I experience the goodness of God of what he's brought me through and where it is that he's brought me. And I just believe that this morning that Manasseh is waiting on some of you. But, but, but see, it takes the getting to this place that, that, that we have to let go. Because so many people, what happens... I just wanted to illustrate this. I heard somebody kind of use this illustration, and I really liked it. Um, I was actually trying to think of a different one, but I don't think there is a better one um, that I could do, right? So I brought my gym bag. They're all sweaty. No, I'm just kidding. But they, uh, so what happens, what happens so many times, right, is that we have all of this stuff that, that you and I, just in living life, it's unavoidable. Stuff happens. You know what I mean? Stuff happens. I'm trying not to cuss this week. You know what I'm saying? So, um, <laughs> If you were here last week, it's okay. I don't, I don't normally cuss. Okay, but, but what happens is, is we, we, we all go through stuff. Like Joseph, he had this family of origin that was like kind of messed up. They were kind of broken. They, they deceived each other and lied about each other. And there was all this conflict and all this hostility that had started not just with his brothers and not just with his dad, but with his grandparents. Like, like there was this, this family line that, that his family of origin was not always the greatest. I heard a preacher say one time, you know, Jesus is in our heart, but we've all got our grandpa in our bones. And it's so true. See, so many times we, we, we look and, and, and we're like, man, why do I still have all these issues? Why do I still have all this stuff that's going on? And, and, and so many times it's like, because we haven't let go of all the other stuff. And God's saying, Manasseh, it's time for Manasseh. And so what happens is, is, right, we have like our family and the hurt from our family and all this stuff. And so we just kind of pack that away. And, 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 and this is, you know, where it goes. And, and, and then we have, you know, this, this person that mistreated us and how we were done wrong and, and all this stuff. And we're like, okay, so there's that hurt. And I got to put that in the bag. I got to chalk that resentment right there. And then, you know, maybe we were let go or, or somebody else, you know, betrayed us and we were laid off or we had this loss that we endured and it just, the pain and the hurt of the loss, whether it be a, from a loved one or from a job that we did, you know, we've all experienced loss at one time or another. And so we got to kind of pack that loss in there. And then for so many of us, you know, you can name it, but it's this issue after issue after issue and thing. And we remember all the hurts, and we remember all the bitterness, and how we were done wrong, and all the stuff that takes place. And for so many people, what I've noticed is it really manifests in a couple of different ways, and actually a number of different ways, but for a lot of people, what happens is you either walk around really defeated, kind of hopeless, not thinking that anything can ever be better, not thinking anything can ever change, making almost excuses for why things are the way that they are, because you didn't come from the right background. You didn't have the right opportunities growing up. And so we have all these self-limiting kind of beliefs that we put on ourselves of giving up on our dreams and giving up on our future could ever look any brighter. Or we don't get defeated. We just get angry. We just get mad. And we walk around, you know, with a chip on our shoulder I know it's too small. <laughs> we walk around with a chip on our shoulder, just ready to go at any moment. And so for so many people, I don't know if I can even zip it, it's all right. This is life right here. I'm ready to go or I'm ready to fight. 
And we walk around, and all of our relationships, every opportunity, we're like, I'm ready for something to go wrong, because the second it goes wrong, I'm out. My bags are packed. I'm ready to go. I heard this week um, that there was a, in foster, foster kids, some of y'all have been foster parents before, and I, I heard um, that I thought was really interesting, that even after a foster child gets adopted, Many times they have a hard time unpacking their bags because there's no permanency. There's no stability there. They're not used to it. They don't know what that means. And so oftentimes what happens with people, and I've seen it time and time again with the church, holy cow, you're looking for one wrong move, one person to say just the wrong thing at the wrong time, one person to not say hi, and you're like, I'm out. My bags are packed because I'm carrying all that with me and I've never forgotten it. They did it to me before. These people are going to do it to me now. And it's all defense mechanisms. None of us mean it. But it's how we cope. It's how we've learned to protect ourselves. And maybe, maybe it's not that you leave, like that you abandon ship. Like you're like, oh, this is happening again. I'm, I'm running away. Maybe it's like, I dare you to come at me. I, I dare you, right? And you're ready for a fight at all times. I will never be pushed down again. I will never be beat down again. I will never let somebody talk to me that way again. And we're ready to fight or we're ready to flee at all times. And a lot of people walk around with a suitcase and a boxing glove ready to go. And God says, Manasseh. See, because what Joseph was able to do, and he just says it with his kids, is that he was able to endure what you and I endure all the time, what you and I have endured throughout the course of our lives as well since we were kids. Life has not been perfect, and life has not been easy, and stuff has not gone our way. And we look back and we're like, God, where's the purpose in all of this? Where is it that you're taking me? Where is it that you're leading me? And Joseph, through all of that as well, But he did something that we forget to do oftentimes. We like to hold on and we like to remember. But Joseph chose to forget. He chose to forget all that and to step into the plan and the purpose that God had for his life. Because I think Joseph realized something that you and I fail to realize a lot of times. That in order for us to truly walk in our purpose, in order for us to truly walk in our calling and, and, and step into what it is that God has for us, it requires letting go of the past hurt and the past pain and the past stuff. It requires taking off our boxing glove and saying, God, I'm here. My heart has to stay pure. I can't get bitter. I can't get resentful. I can't, get, I can't let this unforgiveness and all of this stuff eat away at me anymore. I have to let that all, I have to have Manasseh. I've got to let it all go so that I can step into what God has for me. Because if I don't, even if God elevates me to the position that I believe he's called me to, I will burn it down. And I, will, and I will hurt everybody that gets in my way. Joseph says it. He says, he says uh, the first boy he named Manasseh because God had caused him to forget all the hardship and even his family. In other words, everything that his family had done to him, he didn't carry it around with him anymore. And then he has another son named Ephraim. And Ephraim says, means the Lord has made me fruitful. That really means fruitful. It says, the Lord has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. So even though Joseph wasn't even reunited with his family yet, even though he was still in Egypt, right there in that place, God was still able to use him. He still was able, Joseph's life still bore fruit even in the land of his affliction, even in the place that he didn't necessarily want to be. And maybe you're in a place right now that you don't want to be and you don't even know, looking back, how you ended up there. But God can still make your life bear fruit. 
you can still be fruitful. If you'll choose to let go of all of the stuff and, 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 and forget how they hurt you and how they mistreated you and, and, and lay it all down, let God take care of all of that stuff. Why? Because we want our life to bear fruit. And you don't get Ephraim without Manasseh. If you refuse to let go of it, it will hinder you from bearing the fruit that God wants your life to bear. I remember there's all these kind of opportunities for this, right? Like I, I've, I've been in ministry stuff since I was 18, so 20 years now. And uh, um, I remember like I was a youth pastor when Stephanie started, me and Stephanie started dating. Um, it's actually how we met. And uh, I was, but I was a youth pastor. And um, I remember when we started dating, there was a, I used to plan, we had like youth retreats and like camps and stuff. And so it was my job to get like the camp speakers and, and all that and coordinate all those things, you know. And, and um, I asked Stephanie, I was like, hey, you know, would you want to speak at one of these camps that we're doing? Like you can preach and, and you can do it. And she didn't want to do it at all, you know. Stephanie's not a talker. And um, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. I can't get too serious. Okay. So, um, but she didn't, she didn't really want to do it. She was nervous and, and didn't really want to do it. And, uh, but she said yes, you know, because she wanted to marry me. And so, um, and so she was like, yeah, I'll do it. And so she went and she spoke because it's like eighth grade camp. Um, I wasn't there. But afterwards, she called me and she was in tears. And she said, I'm never preaching again. She said, don't ever ask me to do that ever again. And I said, what happened? She said, after I got done, there was a teacher that came up to me and just told me how awful it was and how I shouldn't have said what I said and how I didn't hear from God and just belittling her and criticizing her and saying all these just mean, hateful things to her. Like, these are good Christian people. These are church folk. And then I can't tell you how many times throughout our marriage and our, our dating relationship and, and our marriage, we've done some amazing stuff. We've done ministry stuff since we've gotten married. We've been married um, since 2012, 11 years almost. And, you know, there's been times, like we were on the mission field, as many of you guys know, and we got pregnant while we were in Mexico. And I'll never forget with the people we had partnered with, we told them, like, hey, we're pregnant. We're going to go back to the States to have Tucker um, and have our, our kid. And they looked at me, and they looked at Stephanie, and they said, you know, Jesus was born in a manger. You can have your kid in Mexico. And I was like, no, I can't. <laughs> I remember one time we, had, we were talking to somebody, and, you know, they were telling me about, you know, asking me about what, everything that we had done and, and, and all these things and all my experience and um, they looked at me, and I'd, you know, tell them everything that, that had happened and all the stuff that we had done with youth ministry and, and all that. And they looked at Stephanie, and they were like, well, that's great that what he did, but what did you do? And I wanted to punch him in his mouth. I wanted to get that boxing glove. Because what y'all don't know is that she keeps this place going. She's the backbone of this entire church. Don't let her fool you. Don't let her fool you. Like, I get, I get the praise because I'm the one that's up here, but she's the hero right there. And, and for so long, what happened is that she would carry this around. She didn't speak for years, years and years and years. She wouldn't, she wouldn't preach or speak or share. And then finally, there was this Manasseh moment that occurred. There was this Manasseh moment, and she started to open up to this, because we had planted this church at this time. And she knew that there was women in this house that needed a place and needed somebody to love on them and needed to know that God was still working in their life and still moving through all the pain and all the hardship. And so she started this little women's group on Wednesday nights. There was like four people. And 
And she started doing that. And I'm telling you, Bloom is like taking off. Y'all are killing it. And God has used her to do far and above anything that she could ever imagine. But she had to let the pain of the past stay in the past. See, what happens so many times is we carry our, the pain of the past into our, future, into our present. And by doing that, it affects our future. Because we bring all of that hurt and all of that bitterness and all of that stuff and we allow it to affect the opportunity and where it is that God wants it to go. And I just wanted to remind you that God always brings purpose out of pain. Always. He doesn't cause the pain. He doesn't cause hardship. That's a lie from the pit of hell. But he brings purpose out of it all the time. Nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted. He'll use the hardest moments in your life and he'll turn it around and he'll make it a testimony that helps and blesses other people. Joseph was able to look back he, he, on, uh, to his brothers a few chapters later in chapter 45 of Genesis. Joseph meets his brothers. They're reunited. We're going to look into a lot more detail this next week. But he is able to look at his brothers and this is what he says in Genesis 45, verse 5. Um, he says, and now... Don't be grieved or angry with yourselves for selling me here because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. So G Joseph found his purpose of going through everything that he did. He says, I realized that God sent me here so that I could preserve life. God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land and to keep you alive by great deliverance. Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, Lord to his entire household, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. See, even through all the stuff that Joseph had gone through, the reason he was able to keep his heart so pure, the reason he was still able to act generously and act in love is because he refused to allow the resentment and the bitterness of what he had gone through affect how he was going to live the rest of his life. And we have to refuse to do the same. We have to be willing to say, God, this may not be enjoyable, this may be difficult, this may be hard, but I refuse to allow it to get inside of me because I'm not going to go through the rest of my life trying to fight people and trying to run away from people. I know that you've got way too much in store for me and I refuse to allow any of that stuff, hold it back. And the only thing we can do, because we cannot change the past, we can't go back and do it over, none of us get a do-over. The only thing we get to do is take it to the cross. Because we're either going to carry it or we're going to surrender it. And I don't know about you, but I refuse to carry it. And so if it takes me every day taking it to the cross, because week in and week out, me, just like you, have opportunity to carry pain and to carry bitterness and to carry hurt and all of this stuff. There's not a week that goes by that's not a, there's not an ire, the fire to put out. There's not a week that goes by that's not an opportunity for, for things to happen. But when you get to a place that you said, God, I refuse to allow any of this stuff distract me from my calling and distract me from my purpose, Manasseh. Manasseh. And your life will bear fruit. See, the thing we always, we, we tend to forget sometimes is that God restores. He's a restorer of all that was lost. Joseph he goes through all this, and he gets to this point that he says, man, God, you've caused me to forget. Your goodness has been too good. I don't even remember all of that stuff because I just see the goodness of God. And God restores him. His family ends up coming to Egypt. The next 17 years of Joseph spends with his, his family and his father there in Egypt. And I don't know what it is that you lost. I don't know what it is that, 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 maybe, that maybe you feel like you missed out on. But I'm just here to remind you that God will restore it. That if you'll give it to him, if you'll keep following him, if you'll keep in an attitude of surrender, an attitude of, of, of saying, God, I'm not going to let this stuff eat away at me, he is a restorer. Joel 2.25 says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent for you. You see time after time after time of people in Scripture that have endured great loss. 
And God's seen them through to bring restoration. I told you our story with some of Stephanie's story. Certainly there's been opportunity for hurt and we could go around this room and I know many of you, you have your own stories of good church folk and church experience where you've endured hurt. Where you've had people talk about you and mistreat you and do you wrong and treat you unfairly and, and, and all of these things. And I just pray that you find Manasseh. You know what it was for us? We were, me and Stephanie were talking about this week. That Manasseh, you know what it was? It was all of you. It was this house that brought so much healing into our heart. I told you some of my story a few weeks ago. So much healing into our heart. Where now we look back on all that stuff, and I can tell you those stories, because I don't look back and remember it with any kind of resentment or hurt or bitterness or anything. I look back on it now, and I'm saying, God, look what you've brought me through, and look what you've done. Your goodness is so good that I can't be resentful. I can't be uh, unforgiving. I can't be have any of that stuff because I'm just too busy being grateful and thanking God for his goodness and everything that he's brought me through and everything that he's done in my life. Caleb and y'all can come back up. I wanted to share them to share this song um, that I heard this week, and um, I believe that it'll help some of us um, as we reflect on it. Before we do, um, actually, no, let's do the song. Yeah, as, as, we, as, as they're singing this, as they're singing this song, um, you don't have to stand. I know normally we're like stand up and we worship, but what I really would like you to do is just receive it, honestly. This song is called Manasseh, and I heard it uh, very recently, and um, I've just been listening to it over and over and over and so I pray that as you, as you hear this, that um, you just reflect on the lyrics. And more than that, you'll reflect on how good God's been to you. it all. 
You know, as I was praying this week and this morning, I just really felt uh, really strongly that for some of you, God wants to bring Manasseh into your life. He wants to bring Manasseh into your life. He wants to create such healing in your heart and healing in your uh, spirit, healing in your mind, that you look back, and, and, and I'm not belittling or downplaying what you've been through, but all I'm saying is Manasseh is possible and that God wants to bring a Manasseh into your life where you look back and you say, God, I, I lay it all down. I refuse to hang on to all of that stuff because I believe that what you're bringing me into is a season of fruitfulness and a new season of where it is that you can work and move in my life and through my life. But I'm telling you that it only is possible if you're willing to lay it all down. That's the only way Manasseh happens. Because as long as you're carrying it around, God can't do it. So this morning, I'll tell you how to do this. It's actually quite simple. You know, Jesus says, or Hebrews says, that uh, I will be merciful towards their, their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. You know why it's possible for us to forget how we've been done wrong? It's because Jesus, God, forgets how we've done him wrong. He forgets our sins. He forgives ours for all of this stuff and all the things that we carry. And I think that this morning that and in fact, maybe the, uh, the, the path to forgetting is through remembering. But not remembering the hurt, not remembering the pain, not remembering what they did to us. But it's by remembering the cross. It's by remembering the price that Jesus paid for us so that we could be forgiven and free and healed. Because the only way that we're able to lay it down is because we know he's going to pick it up because he's carrying it for us, so we don't have to carry it anymore. This morning, we're going to take up communion, and what better way to remember the price that Jesus paid for us, for our healing and for our forgiveness. 
than through the act of communion. So if you would open your, uh, your things. If, if you need help, Stephanie's really good at opening these. Um, she just had to open mine. I can't get serious too long, y'all. It's too heavy. It's my defense mechanism. Okay. Um, but on the day that Jesus was betrayed, before he went to the cross, he took the bread and he took the cup and he looked at his disciples and he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And he says, this is my body broken for you. And then he took the cup. And he says, this is the cup of the new covenant. This is my blood spilled for you for the forgiveness of sins. Father, I pray this morning that you would bring Manasseh. I pray, God, this morning that as we remember you and the price that you paid for our forgiveness, Lord, that you carry our sins, you carry our baggage, you carry our hurt, you carry our betrayals, you carry the pain, you carry all the stuff. You took it all on the cross and you carry it so that we don't have to. And I pray right now, Father, for healing in this place, but not just healing in bodies, God. I pray for healing in hearts and healing in minds and healing in emotions, God. Lord, that there's those here that have been carrying around the same stuff for years. And I just pray that this morning, God, that maybe you would use this house to have a Manasseh moment that says, this is the day that I let it go. This is the day that I decide that I choose to forget what's been done to me so that I can step into what God wants to do through me because I want my life to bear fruit. If that's you and that's your, that's your commitment today, lift up your hand. I think there's something to be said for saying, that's me. I'm choosing to forgive. I'm choosing to forget. I'm not going to carry these burdens. I'm not going to, hands going up all over the place. Yeah, there's opportunity every day. Father, freedom in Jesus' name. God, I thank you, Lord, that today is the day. God, and when then there's those moments and there are those thoughts that come up and there's emotions that come up and the triggers that happen, Father, Lord, in those moments, would you remind us of Manasseh? Would you remind us that we've forgotten all of that and that you, Lord Jesus, have made us brand new? In Jesus' name, we declare it, we believe it, we receive it right now, Father. In Jesus' name. Can we all say the church? Amen. 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 Thank you guys. Amen. Can we give the Lord praise this morning? Amen. Let's go ahead and stand up on our feet. You know what? Since we just made that declaration, I think it would only be appropriate to sing this chorus one more time to really uh, put a bow on it. Can we put the lyrics back up the chorus one more time? Let's all lift up our hands. Let's just sing this one more time together. This is my Vanessa. You caused me to forget. Your goodness washes over all the pain of my past. This is my Vanessa. You caused me to forget. In all my broken places, you're rewriting what's been written. Thank you for Manasseh. Thank you for Manasseh. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We just lay it all down here. helping us move forward from the hurt, the bitterness, the pain, whatever it is that's been holding us back, we lay it down today, Father. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. If you all would lift up your hands to heaven, I'll pray a blessing over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you.